Hello everyone, um, thank you so much for joining me today on our webinar about approaching the deconstruction of legal services. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Nine Feet Tall work across a number of sectors who are all undergoing transformations in different guises and today we're going to look at how law firms can start to transform the processes and services they offer using deconstruction tools and techniques. So. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, as we work through the agenda today, do feel free to ask questions. Um, there's a question box on your screen. It's very visible. Um, and I hope to, to answer as many of these as I can during the session. And if there are any that I can't get to, um, I'll come back to you individually if we run out of time. So do use that. I encourage you to use that today. Okay. So... The first question I wanted to um, think about today is why is there a need to review the way that we work, the way that we work within, um, within law firms? Um, so we know that clients are demanding more of law firms. Um, it's a given that lawyers are experts and know the law in today's market. Clients expect services to be delivered in a cost-effective way as well. Um, at the right level, using the right and appropriate technology with better access um, and the ability to pick and choose between legal and non-legal services. So clients are savvy um, and loyalty is in question because there are many disruptors entering the marketplace. Um, and tenders are also asking for evidence about sound and innovative practices in client delivery, such as the use of automation, uh, analytics using um, practices such as legal project management. So clients are starting to demand more and more. There's also increasing pressure on costs and profitability as disruptors of, as we said, have entered the marketplace. So clients have always valued high quality service, expertise, relationships and commerciality. And I don't think that's going to change, but they also want to see they're getting really good value for money um, and that routine tasks are are being done cost effectively and as I, I'm sure you all feel um, COOs and finance directors are placing more scrutiny on cost and profitability so it's becoming less acceptable I'm doing inverted commas here to keep just winning work and doing work at any price um, without also assuring the profitability um, and also it's it's no longer um, okay to just you know, absorb hidden costs. So there's increasing pressure on uh, reducing costs and increasing profitability. Also, um, with, with the disruptors that I was talking about in the marketplace, there's a drive to be more efficient, um, to enable more traditional firms to compete with those who were born digital and don't carry the burden of legacy systems and processes which have evolved over time. And also the delightful COVID has uh, introduced uh, well, both um, challenges and opportunities, actually, to reimagine the way services are delivered because uh, we're remote. So that brings challenges and opportunities. And lastly, to retain customer loyalty, we need to think about the true value which is delivered through each process or service and really optimize that as much as we, we can. And that enables you to differentiate your offering in the marketplace. So with all of those um, different sorts of factors at play, what can we do? Today we're going to look at how um, deconstructing and reimagining or rebundling services and processes can transform your business. So firstly, we're going to look at what we mean by deconstruction. And then we're going to look at the key themes or elements within deconstruction, which are important to consider. We'll take a look at some of the challenges faced uh, when reviewing legal processes before looking at a, a, a defining an approach. Then we're going to have um, a really interesting conversation with Ben Maguire, who is the Managing Director of Simmers & Simmers Solutions, about their journey with uh, deconstruction or rebundling. 
uh, and then we'll look at some key learnings from uh, deconstruction efforts and the key takeaways from that before we finally think about once you've identified opportunities how you can make it happen and we're going to do all this in less than 30 minutes so hang on to your hats so if we start at the beginning what is deconstruction what do i mean by deconstruction um, so deconstruction for me is about breaking down the work which is required so that can be a process a service a product um, and really understanding what needs to be done and challenging some of the assumptions that are there that have been born out of years and years of doing something the same way so challenging those assumptions about what needs to be done who should be doing that piece of work that activity should it be uh, someone who is an expert who is highly skilled highly trained or should it be somebody who doesn't have that skill set and it's actually a lot cheaper to uh, employ and a lot less costly uh, for the client um, how should it be done you know what are the processes what are the tools that support what's the tech that supports that activity happening uh, and then when and where does it need to be done so does it need to be done in an office does it need to, can it be done remotely can it be distributed can it be nearshored offshored should it be uh, some kind of um, automation some kind of robotics so looking at all of those to make sure that actually there is value being delivered through that product or process or service um, and there's an opportunity to apply some lean principles to deconstruct the work being done. So to think about what is the value created within each service proposition or process and what is waste. So by waste, I mean needless activity or handoffs that don't add any value to the end service or deliverable for the client or for your internal um, colleagues. Who should be carrying out the element of the process? Which areas are ripe for efficiency gains? Um, how will handoffs work between teams as i said what tool sets are required including workflows and tracking of processes um, and where and when so what are the opportunities we have to change um, where things are completed and when so we've always been in a very much a nine to five environment so is there an opportunity to change that uh, as you look at deconstructing so deconstruction helps us evaluate the direction and future vision of how to operate as a whole it's it's a it's a holistic um, approach and provides a real opportunity to future proof your business so when I think about deconstruction there are some elements that um, are important to me the, the first is around the links of various school of thinking which I think are helpful to consider so when we're looking at process and service deconstruction, understanding lean principles, systems thinking principles and design thinking can be really useful. So if you or your teams aren't familiar with these schools of thought, then it's definitely worth investing some time to learn about them um, as they'll really aid your deconstruction efforts. There's also obvious links to um, uh, innovation approaches as well. So in deconstruction we're trying to think big and bold it's not just about making simple little tweaks to processes but questioning whether some are or will still be necessary or relevant at all in the future um, and it's also about challenging tradition and hierarchy so all of those things those schools of thought need to be thought about um, secondly process and service design is about identifying waste so those activities that don't add any value so as you go through looking at what's happening you're trying to remove wherever possible any waste uh, or reduce it or ensure it's performed by the appropriate team um, so that is a really key element and also to identify what is not waste the opposite of that what's value what's value for the for the customer um, and to do that you really need to talk to your clients um, and try and add that value back in wherever possible and hear what is working and what isn't. Um, 
as I mentioned before, beginning uh, process or service deconstruction also requires a cultural shift. So much like approaching innovation, it's a learning process and you don't normally hit the jackpot on the first attempt. So it requires time and patience to unlearn some of what is ingrained practice. But once your, your teams get started on the deconstruction journey, it can unleash a passion to deliver real change. Um, also, a key principle of some of the schools of thought I mentioned earlier, so lean design and system thinking, thinking is about redesigning with a customer in mind. So again, talking to your clients to get a really deep understanding of what they want, need, and value. Uh, and linked to this, the, the, uh, the goal in lean is to create flow. So that's with demand being driven by the client rather than being pushed by your legal team. Um, and this topic, it, there's quite a lot of depth in this topic, so we can't cover it in detail today, but there's plenty of reading online if you are interested in it as a concept. And finally, deconstructing um, services or processes is not about technology and slapping a bit of automation over the top of what you already do. It's important to identify, though, um, appropriate tool sets to support teams to do their jobs, particularly when work's becoming distributed, so real-time visibility of progress uh, and being able to access that whenever you need to becomes even more critical than before. So what are some of the current challenges firms are facing? Um, firstly, the client experience often has not been purposefully de designed. It's, it's evolved over time. And so many processes or services are not efficient or delivering best value. Also, um, as the client experience has evolved, so the processes, tool sets, delivery methods and ways of working across different practice areas and different locations, which all lead to a variable experience for clients, depending on which team or practice area a client works with. We see um, the collection of information, sending of receiving documents is still inefficient in many instances, and that interrupts the, the flow that I was just alluding to. So, how can you make that a really streamlined, efficient value adding? It's repeatable throughout all service delivery. Um, historically, legal processes um, and design work has been pretty painful. Uh, so we've seen project after project where process mapping has gone on for months or occasionally years. Um, and when you finally get to um, reprocess changes, they take that long to deliver that they're now obsolete before they're ready to implement. So um, that is a historic uh, thing that's happened. And I think we need to change the mindset about how process review and, and service reviews should happen. Um, so there are considerable skills gaps as well around the understanding of process design and service design um, and some of the schools of thinking which support the development of efficient value-adding processes and services. So there's work there to, to make sure that actually teams who are getting engaged in this know, they understand enough about what they're trying to do, um, and actually they're inspired to, to be able to do that because they've had some, some training and some coaching um, to help them. Um, and all of those things mean that potentially client expectations are not well managed or their experience is dependent upon an individual lawyer or a team which they work with, which can feel like a roulette wheel. So um, the goal of deconstruction is to create something which is can be applied uh, across teams, across practice areas, obviously with nuances, but that it really bakes in value being added to the client regardless of where the work comes in and where the work is done. So that high quality um, is maintained throughout. So um, how do we approach deconstruction? Um, well, firstly, we recommend adopting a really simple model. Um, that's really critical. So what you want is something that can be explained to teams that everybody gets that's really clear. So you can see in front of you, we have a six step approach, uh, st six stages. So the first thing we do is assess the candidates for deconstruction, because normally you've got 
processes and you've got maybe some teamwork or a service area so we um yeah so we assess which area we're going to look at first and then stage two we validate that prioritization using data um, so we go and collect some data to make sure actually our, our first sort of stab at prioritizing an area is is right and it's valid um, and then we uh, work to understand the current process or service the value which needs to be delivered and start the redesign process so uh, focus on client needs and that is the the real bit of deconstruction that's the deconstruction review in stage three and then we create a plan um, so what work needs to happen behind the scenes to enable us to test out this this new vision of a of a minimum viable process or or service uh, and then we test it so we do the do we try it out and see what happens does it work as we expect to there benefits are there things that fall down that don't work properly and then we um, gather data about that and then we do a review to evaluate the results so it's an iterative method um, it's not like the traditional waterfall methods that a lot of law firms have used in the past to do process and service reviews um, so why does our model work well firstly because it's simple it's repeatable and it helps you to quickly demonstrate results so you get traction quickly so I think those three things are really important when you're starting on a deconstruction journey to make sure that actually you can get through and understand whether things are working quickly and demonstrate results. So I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about the actual stages. So breaking down the model a little bit. So in stage one, you can see um, you use this to essentially to assess the potential processes or services for review. And we use a little assessment tool to support that. So basically you funnel in a few uh, different processes or, or service areas or team structures and answer some questions. Um, and that helps you to prioritize uh, services or processes. Um, and then in the second stage, the data capture um, helps to validate that. So we use questionnaires for um, teams, uh, for process owners, and we capture uh, PMS and CMS data to help support that um, validation of a selected focus area. So we go from a high level down to identifying exactly what we want to focus on. And it may not be a whole process and it may not be a whole service or it might be um, but we have a ring fenced area of scope at the end of that, which we then get agreement on. And in stage three, we start um, design, which is the exciting, sexy bit. Um, so that's the deconstruction review. So that's all about assessing, OK, what happens right now? What's the as is um, using workshops and interviews? Um, and what do we think could be? Um, the 2B, the future. So to understand that, you've got to understand what's the value you're trying to deliver to your client um, and uh, what are the critical things that are actually going to make that process or service successful and also what are the tools and the tech you need to, to support that. And that's where we do a lot of challenge. So we talk about what is actually essential and what is nice to have or waste or not really adding um, adding anything but just uh, creating more work um, so at that point we would be able to create a, a kind of business case to say this is what we think we should do and this is the minimum viable process or service that we expect to be able to to create um, so we get that agreed we then move on to the planning so uh, in this um, stage we need to break down and understand all the required activities to get to the point where we can do a test. So that might be, we might need to uh, train people, we might need to introduce some new tech, we might need to rewrite some processes, update job description. I mean, there can be a lot of things in, in, this, um, in this phase, but we're basically understanding what is required to be able to run a test on our minimum viable process or service so we document that we create a plan and then we do the do which um, is where we test it out um, so 
that is where we actually run that service, run that process, collect feedback from the teams involved, from clients about their experience, but also capture data about uh, time, you know, time taken, efficiencies, about cost, about um, outcomes, um, so that we have something to look at at the end. It's not subjective, it's an objective uh, review. And then in stage six, really critical, we take all that data and that information and we sit down and we work through it and see what the outcomes have been and the benefits and then think about, well, what would we recommend and take that forward for, for approval? So do we recommend to implement it straight away across team, a number of teams? Do we recommend to tweak it, to iterate it? Or do we recommend that actually it, it's not better? It, we've had some unexpected consequences and actually we don't want to proceed and do any more work. So that is the the six stages. And as I mentioned before, it's iterative. So it's not normally a a once around the loop and you're done. It's normally learning all the time. So um, now we've been through the model, I'm really delighted that we're going to be speaking to Ben Maguire today, who is the Managing Director of Simmons and Simmons Solutions, to find out about the work they've been doing on deconstructing or rebundling legal services. So Ben is uh, going to share some insights with us. Hi Ben, lovely to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Not at all. Great pleasure, Tiggy. Brilliant. Um, well, we'll jump straight into it because we don't have a massive amount of time. So um, I just wanted to ask you um, to share a little bit with us about the journey that um, you and the team have been on at Simmons and Simmons uh, with the construction or rebundling. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been quite a quite a long one, and uh, I suppose there are three or four elements to it so we probably started off three or four years ago looking at how we could deconstruct uh, the very essence of what we do which is really matter deconstruction so breaking it down into the process parts and and then uh, uh, improving each of those parts but actually what we learned from that which was really a pilot was that bigger change was um, uh, much easier if we um, trained people to change their behaviors rather than mm -hmm. focusing just on the process. So we rolled out a very long program for about 12 months where we trained everyone in something we call the service excellence standard, which was focused on behavioral change of delivery of mm -hmm. those, uh, those matters. And then what we've also been doing continuously alongside um, the, the sort of core optimization of service delivery is developing new capabilities or acquiring new capabilities such as data mm -hmm. science and legal engineering capabilities, mm -hmm. flexible resourcing, product development, new technologies, and then seeing where we can improve by enhancing matter delivery and starting to bundle those matters back together with these enhanced capabilities to compete in different ways. And then I suppose the um, the other thing we do have, which in, certainly in the UK at the moment is we have Bristol, uh, the Bristol office, so we're mainly focused in London, but we have the Bristol office, um, which is a, a way of reducing the cost of delivering some services, but it is not an outsourcing centre. We don't, we haven't mm -hmm. gone for that for that model at all. So there's a whole array of things really, which um, we have uh, been through in terms of really analysing how we deliver work, how we structure the work, how we resource the work, and also then how we can enhance and innovate around the service delivery. I'm I'm really interested that you talk about your culture change journey. I mean, that's my experience that it's hearts and minds and actually giving people the right yeah the right training the right coaching the right support to enable them to unleash a bit of creative thinking how how um how did you find rolling out the cultural aspects of your program so yeah i mean i, th I think there's some really key issues here you're quite right tiggy and what we learned from the matter deconstruction pilot is actually we needed the people who we wanted to change to lead it and so in our service excellence program, uh, every single training program, every single application of new tools and technology was led by the practice group head. 
it's having been designed for that practice group and actually that market or office, depending on where they were in the world, by the service excellence team with the practice group head. And then they would lead it, be supported by the team, and then the team would take, uh, sorry, the practice group would take ownership of that change um, in the context of the way they worked as opposed to having them being imposed upon them. So that was really critical and, and, and led to significant success. Yeah, and I think often, so where you have innovation teams or business improvement teams, if they're driving it, it's never fully owned by mm. the business. So that sounds like a really great move. Um, so I'm sure it wasn't all plain sailing. Can you tell us about some of the challenges that you faced on that journey? Yeah, I mean, some, some of the challenges are actually quite nice challenges to have. So where people are have very successful practices, embedding a sort of a, a change uh, in the way they're doing things is actually quite challenging um, because it's very difficult to see an incentive to do so. And uh, in those cases, what we focused on was the client experience of that service and making clear to them that, you know, it might be that you're profitable now, it might be that you're having a great time now and clients are saying nice things to you but only take somebody to come along and give them a much better experience mm -hmm. and then you start to threaten your model so you'd still need to evolve the way you develop things and at the other end of the spectrum for those that were under a lot of pressure so practices that might be under a lot of market pricing pressure mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to concentrate on change when you're just trying to keep the boat afloat as it were right mm -hmm. and so we had to be very cognizant of that fact and design the training and the change over and recognize it's going to take a long period of time them owning it um, and mm -hmm. and show so sh slow incremental process uh, progress if you like and so those those were two of the key challenges i suspect mm -hmm. and did you have any pushback about taking people out for training or coaching or involvement in design work um it, how do you mean in terms of um, in terms the of out so if, if practice heads and then some members of the team were involved in workshops or working through ideas did you have any pushback from partners about bringing people out of billable work to do some of this thinking no i think that the key there was um actually no, no we never had that and we and we didn't have it because it became it was the responsibility of the group to improve themselves not the responsibility of my team to make them improve themselves and um and we had you know support right from the top of the organization we've done a lot of pre-work six seven months of consulting to see how best we could roll these these things out mm -hmm. so everyone was prepared and building themselves up to this program so now actually you know every every group wrote its own case studies for the training and they were written by the fianas in the group and yeah we never had any really any trouble in in that sense that's brilliant and what about your tips for success then so we've got firms who are listening thinking yeah we started this or we, we want to start doing this have you got some top tips that you can share? Yeah, it's like, it's like anything really. Um, this, I mean, it really reminds me of people trying to apply, say, lean or total quality management techniques into health services or professional yeah. services. The critical part of it is the philosophy not the cookie cutter approach that other people have taken which you're just trying to land on people so you've got to have a core philosophy which is to improve customer experience improve efficiency value for money returns to the firm based on the effort you're putting in mm -hmm. but you don't you, should, you must not be wedded to simple formulaic ideas or ideas that have worked elsewhere you need to be able to take the time to adjust mm -hmm. the way you're going to approach these things to make it work for the people that you're working with and to give them the responsibility and ownership for delivering it because at the end of the day you know it isn't my job to make other people better at their job it is my mm -hmm. job to help them make themselves better mm -hmm. at their job and as long as you bear that in mind and you are patient and you understand it's going to take time then it's uh, you know going to be a very successful exercise that's brilliant. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights with us. I really appreciate you taking the time. That's my pleasure entirely. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed um, that little conversation. Um, so good to hear about the challenges and the tips that um, that Ben and the team have uh, have. Uh, 
found during their journey. So um, what have we learned during our deconstruction um, projects? The, the first thing I'd say is that deconstruction is tricky. Um, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it right. Um, but we're still seeing firms who are embarking on process reviews and are still stuck there six to 12 or long months or longer um, later. So it's not easy, but um, there are some things that you can do to help uh, get some traction and some progress. So the first thing is not to take on something enormous if you if you haven't done it before you're not that confident your teams aren't that confident so ring fence the scope of reviews i would say to start off with um and get some get some traction so do do a bit of it and see how you fare and then as you grow in confidence you can expand the scope of what you want to take on but as we said before, it's a cultural journey. So, yeah, start start with purpose. Don't go too big would be my number one takeaway. Um, second one is, um, yeah, understanding it is an iterative process. So if your teams are not used to working in that way, if they're used to defining, fully defining requirements to the nth degree of detail, this is going to be a learning curve um, and it might feel a bit uncomfortable because people are used to getting things 100% right. That's what they're paid for. And this feels uncomfortable. Um, but you've got to keep doing it and keep learning. And that's the way that actually you can really uncover some great ideas and some great um, insights. So it's helping people with that, helping them through that journey and supporting them to try things and be brave. Um, the third thing is about getting clients involved. So I've said this, and I say this probably in every webinar that I ever, ever do, is get your clients involved. Pick the right ones, obviously. Pick, pick ones who want to be involved, but get them involved because that's how you hear the real feedback about what's working and what isn't. And actually to design with the client in mind, you have to know what the client thinks. So you've got to ask the question. Be brave. Uh, hear the feedback. and then. I mean, it's gold, you know, if, if you get that feedback, it's really important. Um, and then also get skilled up. So teams probably need some training. Um, it can be invaluable to bring in a partner who is experienced um, to help uh, support teams. So um, and that that kind of external non-legal insight can be really helpful. So have a think about that. And then lastly, just thinking about how to get started. So um, I'm often asked, how, how do you start these kind of uh, work? So um, firstly, think about who you need to have a conversation with. So who, who are going to be the sponsors? Who do you need to get on side? Um, and um, yeah, get those conversations going first, get some support around it. Um, secondly, if you've got innovation teams or business improvement teams, in your organization use them because they are used to um, generating ideas they're used to working in more of an iterative way and they can bring some really great experience to your review as i said use a simple model doesn't need to be ours can be your own but make sure you can explain it simply to your teams that are going to be involved and lastly start small um, and then build momentum and success and don't forget to think about the training that's, that your teams might need. So that was a whistle-stop tour. I know it was through um, deconstruction. Um, if you have um, enjoyed this um, and want to have further conversations about deconstruction, um, then do pick up the phone. Love to talk to you about uh, your journey, if you've started already, if you're thinking about it. Um, and also, we are currently offering a free deconstruction workshop with Nine Feet Tool where we come in and we can talk to a small group of you and your team or teams about defining your approach to deconstruction, um, thinking about uh, priority areas for process or service improvement and um, looking at data, data capture considerations. So do feel free to contact me on the details there and we will send out the details of this webinar 
as well so you'll get the slides with the contact details on um, but thank you so much for joining me today i hope you've enjoyed it i've really enjoyed talking to you